I'm a senior research fellow at Beit Morashah's uh, Center for Ethics and Society, and I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this session. Uh, this session will discuss the right of self-defense in 21st century warfare. Under conventional just war theory, a state is justified in using force in its self-defense. However, the introduction of human rights considerations to the laws of armed conflict and the accumulation of legal rules derived from human rights values has affected some of the issues surrounding the concept of state self-defense. Have these changes created incentives to aggressors of the ad bellum rules and transgressors of the in bello rules? Perhaps the case of the state of Israel and its, leg and its legitimacy to self-defense can serve as an example uh, in this discussion. We have two distinguished panelists to, to analyze these issues. Uh, Yishai Baer is professor of law and the former dean at the Radnisser School of Interdisciplinary Center at Herzliya, Israel. He specializes both in taxation and the law of armed conflict. He's also a retired major general in the Israel Defense Forces. Professor Baer holds a BA from Hebrew University, an MA from London School of Economics, and a PhD from Hebrew University. He was a member of the law faculty of Hebrew University for 23 years and was visiting scholar at both Harvard and NYU law schools. Major General Baer's military career began in 1974. He took part in the 1976 rescue operation in Entebbe and he continued to serve in the IDF, rising through the ranks and combat commands until he commanded a paratroopers br brigade as colonel in 1995 and the Edom division as a brigadier general in 2000. He was also commander of IDF's brigade and division commander's courses. In 2002, he joined the IDF's general staff when he was appointed president of Israel's military court of appeals and promoted to major general. Major General Baer is married to Chagit, and he's the proud father of six children. Arthur Applebaum is professor of ethics and public policy at Harvard University. His work on legitimate political authority, civil and official disobedience, and role morality has appeared in journals such as Philosophy and Public Affairs, the Journal of American Medical Association, Harvard Law Review, and Ethics and Legal Theory. He's the author of Ethics for Adversaries, a book about the morality of roles in public and professional life. Professor Applebaum has written about the ethics of executioners and butlers and has consulted to the government about the ethics of spies. His recent articles include Legitimacy Without the Duty to Obey and Forcing a People to be Free. He has been a member of Harvard's Advisory Committee on Shareholder Responsibility and chairs the Ethics Advisory Board of a Stem Cell Research Foundation. From 2007 to 2009, he was acting director of the Edmund J. Safra Foundation for Ethics at Harvard. Professor Applebaum holds degrees from Princeton and Harvard. He was a Fulbright Scholar in Jerusalem, a fellow in ethics at Harvard, and Rockefeller Fellow at Princeton University's Center for Human Valu Values. Each panelist has been asked to present for about 20 minutes, after which we will devote about 10 or 15 minutes to questions and answers from the audience. Professor Baer. Thank you very much, Eugene, and thank you all. I'm very proud to be here since I'm familiar of the great contributions that Beth Morsha has upon and its effect upon the IDF, and I'm proud to take part of this uh, project. May I start with a personal note? I'm a lawyer, but what brought me to this field of international law is my capacity as a general. For the last five years, I was a corps commander. The Israeli military has two corps, so in I was in charge of, part of mainly, or generally speaking, of the Israeli army. And my core uh, position, or main object, was the Lebanese uh, front. I have started to learn the intelligence, and then I've started to learn the law. 
And then I became frustrated. I do know that uh, it's not common to bring one's uh, trauma to the podium. It is much cheaper than go to the sh shrink, of course, but <laughs> it is indeed my own trauma and my own experience. The current legal rules prevailing under current international law, when it comes to law-abiding states, wants to obey the law and to keep the moral values, and specifically when they are fighting non-law-abiding either states or militia groups, we are currently out of balance. And so the, uh, my main argument in this uh, short presentation would be to present how far we are from proper balance in this uh, segment of the law. The current rules may present them very briefly. The current rules of international law are divided into two segments. The, one, oh, the first segment is the ad bellum rules, namely when wars uh, are allowed or when states are allowed to use military force. And the other segment of the law is what is called in bello, namely how states are allowed or how militaries are allowed to fight. The first segment is currently governed by the UN Charter. In the UN Charter, following its precedents, the League of Nations and, before, and the Clock Briand Pact, if you may, the Wilson, President Wilson legacy, has declared that military force is not allowed anymore. Namely, states are not allowed to use military force proactively. This is the current UN Charter. It has two exceptions. One, self-defense. The other exception is when there is authority of the Security Council. Since the Security Council is an impotent body, there is one exception, the Korean War, and to a lesser extent, the Iraqi case. But by and large, since the Security Council doesn't function, we are having only one main exception to the prohib prohibition, which is self-defense. The problem is that the limits or uh, the uh, current self-defense exception is very limited. It may apply only when armed uh, attack occurs. That means, for example, that any hum humanitarian intervention is not legal, legally speaking. So take the case of Syria. Nowadays, more than 30,000 people have been, mur have been murdered. But China and Russia are absolutely correct when stating that humanitarian intervention is out of question, legally speaking. Of course, not morally. The moral uh, uh, perspective is quite or is totally different in this uh, case. When it comes to the in bello uh, rules, the main two uh, rules which are, makes a lot of sense, of course, are the, the distinction rule, namely civilians are out of the game or the war game was Clausewitz who said 200 years ago that a, a states fight. It has, I mean, according to Clausewitz theory, the people and the military fight. But since the 19th century, the international community has adapted the idea that civilians should be spurred. And so we are now having the uh, distinction rule. And then the proportionality, which if I will have time, I will uh, consider that. So this is a basic contour of the prevailing legal rules. The main problem is that it just doesn't work. Let's start with the ad bellum section or part of the law, namely the prohibition not to use uh, uh, proactively uh, military force. The UN has been founded in 1945 after the San uh, uh, Francisco Conference. It took 25 years to the late Professor Thomas Frank of NYU to issue an interim balance of the record of the UN, and I quote, in the 25 years since the San Francisco conference, there have been some 100 separate outbreaks of hostility between states. And then Professor Frank concludes, the prohibition against the use of force in relation between states has been eroded beyond recognition. It took another 35 years towards the end of the millennia when another professor, uh, other prof another professor uh, made his own empirical uh, 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 experiment, he checks the data, he checks the data, and then he presents his own normative argument. And now I'm quoting from a different paper now by Professor uh, Glennon. 
And I quote, international rules concerning the use of force are no longer regarded as obligatory by states. Between 1945 and 1999, two thirds of the members of the United Nations fought 299 conflicts in which over 22 million people were killed. This year's of conflict was kept by the Kosovo campaign in which, the NATO, in which NATO violated the charter. The international system has come to, to succeed in a parallel universe of two systems. One is the, the euro, the other de facto. The, the euro system consists of illusory rules that world govern the use of force among states in a platonic world, a world that does not exist. The, the euro facto system consists of actual state practice in the real world, a world in which states recost against benefits. So we are having two universes. And may I have only another one quote, one sentence from the great scholar Michael Walzer is sitting here. And Michael Walzer, in his book, writes that lawyers have constructed a paper world which faces at crucial points to correspond to the world the rest of us still live in. May I demonstrate it by only one a, a, an example. When Russia invaded Hungary in the 50s and Czechoslovakia in the 60s, it legally justified its own activity, namely the invasion, the fighting against uh, people who rebelled in order to gain the freedom, the justification for the invasion of Hungary and uh, Czechoslovakia by the Soviet bloc was self-defense. Collective self-defense under the Warsaw Pact. This is the world or the gap between rhetoric and practice, the gap between the real world in the lawyer's world. But may I go farther? And I would like to point at some incentives, and I do mean incentive, given to aggressors and trans transgressors currently under the prevailing rules. And I will point, due to the uh, short limit of time which I have, upon five segments of such incentives, or five different types of incentives. Most of them are justified per se. There are rules, or rules of, of the law of armed conflict and the law of war, which are justified, most of them are justified per se. But when we are looking at them as a whole, the bottom line is a distorted reality in which there is incentive, or there are great incentive to breach the law rather than to keep it incentives to aggressor and transgressor, and this is the world in which we live in. The first incentive, under the prevailing rules, there is a total separation between the ad bellum segment of the law and the in bellum. The mere fact that state A invaded state B doesn't have any connection whatsoever to the treatment in which the soldiers of state A and B are entitled to both entitled the same benefits. Of course, the leading example in the literature is that the German who invaded Poland in September 1, 1930, the September the 1st, 1939, the Wehrmacht soldier enjoys the same benefits as do the Pol soldier. The Allies in the 40s who fought against the Nazi, a Nazi, a Nazi a, 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 a apparatus against the Wehrmacht enjoy the same legal treatment. Of course, to some extent, it's against our basic intuition. It has, it should be, I think it has, more philosophers do argue whether it's correct or not. The vast majority of them think that it's a good uh, uh, rule, and I do think that they are right. May I mention only two points? First of all, it's very difficult. I, I brought, of course, the Hitler's, uh, uh, the Nazi uh, example, the Germans' invasion to Poland, but in most cases, when two states fight each other, everyone justifies itself with uh, arguing that it has its own legitimacy. So it's very uh, difficult to say when we don't have a, a proper judge or, uh, who can uh, manage, who is just, whose wars is just. So it makes sense to have the same rules to all participants. Furthermore, when you think about the reciprocal uh, uh, consideration, uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, to deter 
the German soldiers, when they are fighting the, the Allied soldiers, that they have to treat the prisoner of war, the wounded, uh, the wounded soldiers of the advers adversary, etc., etc., in a similar treatment. So it gives them incentive to play by the rule. But the bottom line is that when an aggressor decides to attack, he knows for sure that his soldiers won't be punished for that. Whether he, the leader, will be punished, let's talk it, about it in a few minutes. I can tell you the secret, he won't be punished. The leader won't be punished either. But the soldiers of the aggressor are not punished whatsoever. So here you have the first incentive to aggressors. And here comes the second. In fact, there are no punitive tools, actual punitive tools. There is no punishment against aggressors in the current world. May I give a few examples? In the old days, reprisal was very effective. You breach the law, reprisal will put you in place. We shall revenge. So if you cross the red line, we shall cross the red line too. But now the mere fact that you are a criminal doesn't justify, according to the rule, any reprisal from my own side. So reprisal, which is very deterring, has very deterring effect, is not relevant anymore, is not legal. A second ex example. In the old days, there were territorial prizes. If an aggressor attacked a defensive, a defended state, and then he lost territory, he lost territory. He is being punished. Nowadays, territories are not asset anymore, we are having CPAs here, it becomes a liability. Look at the case of Israel with the occupied territories. Look at the case of uh, 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 the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. The minute you conquer uh, territories, you are, have so many obligations vis-a-vis -vis the uh, local domestic citizens, and at the end of the day, you are obliged to return the territories. So, this has also a, 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 a some kind of an incentive to the aggressor, he won't lose anything. A third example from this uh, uh, type of uh, argument, monetary uh, or financial compensation. It makes a lot of sense to impose financial uh, sanctions vis-a-vis -vis aggressors. But at the end of the day, in most cases, they are not effective. Think about the Versailles Pact and the effects of the com a, 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 a compensation imposed upon Germany after World War I, and what effect it had upon a, a, the Third Reich. Hitler leveraged and manipulated the story of this compensation in order to come to power. Maybe there is an exception in the case of Saddam Hussein, a, which had to pay compensation, but this is a unique example because it brings to the, uh, it, it is an example of a dictator who has budget or financial resources of his own, but this is not the unique, uh, the typical case. So by and large, I can say that there are no actual punitive tools against aggressors. You are abided by the law, he doesn't obey the rules, you have to play by the rules, he doesn't. The third example which I would like to present is a modern trend which is prevailing currently by judges, respected professors, the legal community, substantial part of the legal community, and this relates to the ad bellum proportionality. If aggressors attack a state, the defendant state is entitled to defense itself. That's the meaning, that's the essence of the self-defense. But to what, or what are the limits upon its reaction? Now, the current trend is to say that the defendant state it's, has to act proportionality, in a proportional way. The late Thomas Frank said you have to act equally, in a similar manner. So it's almost a win-win situation. Aggressor attack, if he wins, he wins. If he is losing, the maximum reaction that he might suffer is similar to the or equivalent 
to the amount of force that he has used. No deterrence whatsoever. The force incentive to the transaction, the aggressors and, transaction, and transgressors, is the confusion between human rights law and the law of armed conflict. The mere introduction or the mere introducing of human rights ideas to the law of armed conflict should be endorsed. You have to treat your adversaries' civilians, your adversaries' wounded soldier, soldiers in a humanitarian way. This makes a lot of sense. God has created all of us in his own nature, in his own uh, uh, image. Okay. Even your adversary. So it makes a lot of sense to introduce human rights idea to the law of armed conflict. But at the end of the day, there are limits to it. Because war is about fighting for the sake of one's own self-defense. Unfortunately, in war, the name of the game is to kill in order not to be killed. And I can bring one example, a distorted one, from the Goldstein Report. But there are many, many examples. And the example relates to the human shield phenomenon and specific technique adapted by the IDF called knocking on the roof. The human shield phenomenon is not uh, new. It happened in Kosovo, for example, volunteer uh, Yugoslavian uh, 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 gathered on the bridges of Belgrade in order to uh, shield them against uh, NATO's uh, bombardment in 1991. In Iraq, for example, Saddam Hussein used his own people in order to shield his own military assets. When it comes to the Middle East, both Hamas and Hezbollah used it in order to protect the military assets. Under the current prevailing rules, according to the additional protocol of the Geneva Convention, there is a requirement of early warning. It makes a lot of sense. In order to, uh, you have to warn the other side adversary to get out of the arena in order that they won't be killed. They are innocent at the end of the day. But according to the protocol, to the Geneva, Geneva Convention protocol, this is not a mandatory, but rather it's a con contingent obligation. It depends upon the circumstances. So NATO, for example, in the Kosovo campaign, has declared that they are not allow, they are not accepting the early warning requirement. It's not a mandatory one. They want to not to risk their own pilots. So they won't disclose when and where they are going to attack. Israel, in order to spare innocent civilians, adapted a more conservative approach, the early warning. So the technique used in the campaign three years ago in Gaza was to call, use the telephone, the cellular phones, to call local residents, and they give, me, they give them 10 minutes warning, early warning, please get out of this specific building. We do know that there is ammunition in this building or there are rockets. Get out of here and then you spare, you spare lives. What happened since uh, uh, Hamas knew that if our pilots would recognize that there are civilians still in the building, they won't shoot, they won't fire. So the Palestinians reacted by gathering their own civilians on the roof. It is different than total question what's the status of those guys who gathered in the roof if they come voluntarily. If they were imposed, it's of course they are a, a innocent civilian. If they came, if they volunteered to come over there, it's a, a, a very uh, interesting question. They put moral challenge, of course, to our pilots. But let's put it aside. Israel adapted a unique system, very expensive one, which is, doesn't have any parallel in other militaries. Israel, uh, uh, the Air Force has uh, invented a very sophisticated missile, the same missiles, guided, I mean, a very precise guided ammunition, very sophisticated missiles, which can hit the roof by inches. They can hit the corner of the roof 
they don't have explosive, but rather cement as a warhead. And the aim of such missiles is, of course, to, to frighten those gathered in the roof in order to uh, uh, enforce them so to get out, and then when they will, you see, five minutes recommendation. By Israeli standards, it's a recommendation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we should not bargain, you know. Okay, that's fine. Okay, what Israel did is to fire such a, a, a rocket, which its warhead consists of cement, in order to frighten all those people gathered in the roof, and then when they will go uh, uh, away, then to fire the real missile and to hit the target. This is an adventure which has a few uh, derived consequences. First, you risk your pilots and your soldiers because it takes a while, all this process. May I remind you that NATO was not willing to risk its own America. The USA was not willing to risk its own pilots. Israel did risk in order, uh, its own soldiers in order to uh, complete this process. Second, it costs fortunes because every missile, all those missiles, the real ones and the faked ones, the, the one with the cement warheads, cost the same, the electronic cost, not the explosive. When I'm speaking about fortune, we are speaking about hundreds of millions of dollars. So Israel should be praised for that, isn't it? Now I will read a paragraph from uh, the Goston Report. What does the Goston Report has to say about this technique? And I bring it as example, how human rights lawyers bring to absurdum the law of armed conflict. And I quote, the legal requirement, remember the contingent legal requirement, they don't, meant, they don't mention the fact that it's contingent, it's not mandatory, but okay. The legal requirement is for an effective warning to be given. This means that it should not require civilians to guess the meaning of the warning. The technique of using small explosives to frighten civilians into evacuation, even if it is intended to warn, may cause terror and confuse the affected civilian. And then, may I read another sentence? The mission does not consider the technique of firing missile into or on top of buildings as capable of being described as a warning, much less as an effective warning. It is a dangerous practice and in essence constitutes a form of attack rather than a warning. How hypocrisy, or how much hypocrisy can be injected into two sentences? Israel risks its own soldiers. Israel invested millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in order to spare innocent civilians. Of course it's frightened, but this is war. What is the alternative? My best friend, Moshe Halbetal, who is sitting with us, wrote a, a, a great piece in the New Republic answering uh, uh, the Goldstone, or relating to the Goldstone Report, with your permission, Moshe. We have some uh, business to settle currently. I read one sentence. It is rather, and a quote from Moshe Halbertal's piece, printed uh, uh, from the New Republic, it is rather a strange point in the Goldstone Report that this practice, namely the procedure of the uh, roof knocking, which goes a long way to protect civilians, is actually criticized. When I read, uh, uh, Moshe uh, uh, gave me to read the draft, and I read only critic in real time. I told him, Moshe, what language are you speaking? You have to write that it is hypocrisy, that they don't understand the reality in which they are talking about. If the alternative is to kill civilians, it makes a lot of sense to frighten them rather than to kill them, because it is legal to kill them. The NATO <laughs> bombers did kill without early warning. Israel preferred to warn them, indeed to terrify them, in order that they will go away, rather than to kill them. So Moshe Halbertal writes, it is rather a strange point. So I told him, you have to write the truth, namely it's the mission, it doesn't understand, the Gosom report doesn't understand what he talks about, or they're hypocrites. So he told me, you know Ishai, in the States, they are talking in a different manner. Understatement is preferred way of expression. Now, Moshe, it's time, my time to revenge. And I talk the truth and I tell the truth. This way of expression. 
of introducing absurd human rights way of thinking. Namely, it's not fair to frighten citizens, of course. If the New York Police Department will frighten me by knocking on my roof or by knocking on my door, it's not acceptable. But if the alternative in wartime is to kill, it's much better to frighten than to kill. But the Goldstone Report blamed Israel for frightening innocent civilians, forgetting that the alternative was the legal, strictly kosher alternative was to kill them. Unacceptable. Fifth incentive is the lenient approach, lenient approach, too lenient, too much lenient approach towards leaders. You can be an aggressor and transactor, and transactor, and at the end of the day, you don't pay the bill. You don't pay the bill. Look what currently happens in, uh, in Syria. Indeed, there are a few exceptions. The Nuremberg trials, the Rwanda cases, the Yugoslavia cases, the currently uh, the ICC established under the Rome Statute. There is international court, but you know what? There is no definition for the crime of aggression. And since there is no definition for the crime of aggression, you cannot bring aggressor to justice. This is the reality, this is today's reality. So there is an unacceptable, lenient approach towards criminals. I'm talking about criminals' leaders. So all these five components, which I've described very briefly, I'm afraid from the chairman, create an unacceptable package for incentive of aggressor and transaction. What should be done? I don't have time for that. But may I give two clues about potential directions? First, leader's responsibility. When I mean leader's responsibility, not only ex post, but in real time. And there is a special session today about targeted killing. Think about the following names. Hitler, Muammar Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad. How many people are killed, were killed, are going to be killed due to such tyrants and dictators prevailing currently or governing their own state? And the target and killing has substantial moral advantage, which there is a separate session today uh, which will be discussed. Another dimension which should be promoted is, with all due respect to lawyers and to the lawyer's world, as Michael Walzer put it, I think that lawyers have done the best. I mean, the legal documentation, the rules, the prevailing rules are there. They present a compromise. Unfortunately, a bad compromise, which I've just presented, its failures. So it's now time to professional militaries professional soldiers to step in, to moral philosophers to instruct them. I think the ethical values and norms are much more challenging than the legal rules. And I didn't have time to speak about the other segment of the distinction rule, the fact that soldiers can be killed for the sake of the killing currently under the legal rules. Soldiers' blood is the cheapest commodity in the war game. There is a necessity principle under current international law, but even according to the Red Cross, it doesn't have any actual meaning whatsoever. But at the end of the day, what might be challenged, militaries, and I mean militaries of Western democratic liberal states, is introducing more and more ethical values to the uh, uh, war zone. And in short, this is what this conference is all about, in general, and we're talking about a, a Bet Morasha in particular, this is the value added of the Bet Morasha to the IDF. Thank you very much. I completely agree with Ishai's description of the situation. I think that the current uh, laws of war and human rights laws are asymmetrically unfair in the sense that they give advantages to aggressors and to human rights violators. My conclusion is different. My conclusion is, well, it's unfair, and one of the burdens that we have to bear uh, to support the humanity of others and to respect our own humanity is simply to 
uh, assume at least some of those burdens. In fact, my conclusion will be that uh, the nature of 21st century war and the asymmetries of 21st century raw war may in fact uh, call for more protections of civilian populations than is standardly the case rather than less. Here's what I'm going to do, and I'll try to do it um, as quickly as I can. I'd like to, I'm a philosopher, I like to analyze and build things up from little bu building blocks. I'm going to start uh, by um, asking, well, if our topic is what's the right of self-defense in military conflicts in the 21st century, um, first, what's the right of self-defense in military conflicts, but before that we have to ask about what's the right of self-defense at all. So I'm, I'm going to build up from just the basic ordinary moral intuitions about self-defense, add in whether war makes a difference, and then at the end add in whether or not the 21st century um, makes a difference. Okay, um, so what is the right of self-defense? Um, abstract away uh, legal situations, if abstraction is not something that comes easily to you, imagine that we, we're living under laws, but the law is of no avail right now. Someone's attacking us, and the, the police officers are not here. They can't help us. Um, so what, what's the, the, the basic setup of self-defense? The basic setup of self-defense is um, attacker A is to kill defender D. Um, to kill defender D wrongfully, right, if it turns out that attacker A is a duly authorized police officer uh, and defender D is a, is a criminal who's threatening somebody else, then it's not a question of self-defense, right, so, so wrongfully. And we say imminently, right, if defender D has other easy alternatives, um, then self-defense can be avoided. Uh, when that's the case, then D prevents the killing of himself, D, by killing A. And of course, self-defense is not just for oneself, but one could also defend others under the same principle, or it could be a C who prevents killing of D by killing A. Now, what are the justifications, ordinary moral justifications uh, for self-defense? Uh, well, it's not an unlimited right of self-preservation. I think we could all admit that, right? There are certain things that are, you should be killed rather than transgress. Um, and um, I think examples come to mind rather quickly. You, you can't kill the entire city in order to prevent yourself from being killed. So it's, it doesn't come from an unlimited right of self-preservation. It's not that the attacker forfeits all rights because once you've disarmed the attacker, you can't then go on to kill the attacker, right? Y your rights against the attacker are rather limited. Um, the justification of, of self-defense is not punishment of the guilty. The attacker, in fact, may not, in fact, be guilty, and we'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Rather, the right of self-defense is fairly limited. It's the right to prevent the violation of one's own rights to personal integrity and external freedom, subject to certain constraints. The obvious constraints being that you can't thereby violate other people's rights to uh, personal integrity and external uh, freedom. Uh, to see some of the limitations, let's use some examples from bystanders. Um, so suppose the setup is that the only way you can uh, prevent uh, A from attacking you, your D, the defender, is it turns out there's an innocent bystander who's standing on a bridge and if you shoot the innocent bystander, the innocent bystander's body will fall on the aggressor, on the attacker, and thereby save your life. I think straightforwardly you can't do that. You can't use an innocent bystander in that way and aim at its death at his death in order to save yourself. This is a case of yihareg va'al yavor. You should be killed rather than killed because the right of self-preservation is not unlimited. What if um, the defender grabs B as a shield, the bystander as a shield, so that A shoots into B rather than into D? No, you, you can't take another person and, you, and uh, threaten another person in that way and use another person as a shield. I think that's straightforward. What about if you duck and the bullet goes over your head and hits B? Oh, that's, that's a little more complicated. Probably you can do, right? Because you're not seeking out B's death. You're not using D. Um, and these are things we can spend hours talking about these, but I, I want you to see the complexity of just ordinary moral self-defense before we even introduce uh, war. What if D deflects the path of A's projectile onto the bystander B? Well, maybe, maybe. Um, what if D targets A for seeing that nearby B will also die? Collateral damage. Yes, we, we understand that within, within certain limits uh, that is permissible. Again, because you're not using B for your purposes. You're not violating B's rights for your purposes. Um, but then, of course, there are considerations of proportionality. Uh, suppose that uh, the only way to, you're being attacked by 100 A's, and the only way to defend yourself is by killing all 100. Well, yes, of course you can. It's, it's not as if each hundred, each 
Each of the hundred is actually attempting to violate your rights. Each one is a rights violator, and you can defend yourself against all hundred, right? Um, what about attacking, killing a hundred A's when killing ten A's would be sufficient? Well, there I think it's straightforward that you can't. If you can equally effectively kill only ten of your attackers, you can't kill all hundred. Remember, self-defense is not an entitlement to punish. It's not an entitlement to go after the guilty. It's not an un unrestricted um, right to self-preservation. Um, similarly, what if you can effectively defend yourself uh, by warning away the attacker or by wounding the attacker or the uh, laws in Florida about stand your ground notwithstanding by retreating from the attacker? Well, I think ordinarily we, one sh would conclude that no, you have to take these lesser means. Again, if, they, if the probabilities of defending yourself are equally uh, the same. Um, what if A attacks you for sure, but he only has a 10% 10, 10 probability of success? Well, then yes, I think ra rather clearly you can defend yourself. He is attempting 100% to violate your rights. But what if, if instead you actually don't know if A is an attacker or not? There's only a 10% probability that A is an attacker. Then I think it's rather straightforward that you can't attack A in the off chance that maybe A is an attacker. Um, what if, again, proportionality, what if um, you, D kills A for seeing that uh, the collateral damage will be 100, 100 non-threatening bystanders. Again, we can argue about proportions. There's no algorithm for this. But uh, it seems as if this is excessive. Your, your blood isn't redder, as the Talmud says, right? Um, what if, in order to um, save 100 Ds, you have to directly kill one of the Ds? Uh, now we get into this uh, area of deep, deep moral perplexity. Right. This is an interesting and hard question. What if instead of killing one of the people who is already targeted, it's an innocent bystander who you kill? Uh, this is rather tougher. Right? Arguably, you're not justified in killing one bystander who is not under threat in order to um, save uh, yourself and many of yourselves. We can argue about some of these, but the structure of this, I think, is rather clear. The right of self-defense is not unlimited because there is no unlimited right of self-preservation. There are limitations. There are limitations that are burdensome. There are limitations that actually uh, involve you accepting uh, serious burdens, including death, rather than uh, defending yourself. Um, the justification of self-defense does not depend on the culpability of the attacker. A, the attacker may in fact be mistaken, may think that you're an attacker, mistakenly, right, and perhaps reasonably. Uh, A may be coerced into it, or maybe in the, the war case may be conscripted. A may be insane. A may be a child. Maybe A's brain is controlled by an evil neurologist who's propelling A towards you to attack you. Maybe, in fact, A isn't taking an action at all. Maybe A's body is simply being used as a lethal projectile. I think in, it, it doesn't matter whether A is guilty or innocent. It matters whether A is a threat. And that's all that matters. Okay? So when D may harm A, it's not because A is guilty, bad, or an outlaw in the sense unprotected by the laws because of something that he's done. It's simply that he is liable, not culpable, and he loses his, Im his immunity. It's not because he isn't innocent. Now, this is true not just about A, but it's also true about the bystanders B. When you are permitted to harm a bystander as some kind of collateral damage, it's not because the bystander is guilty, bad, or an outlaw. It's not because of the bystander's political affinities. It's not because the bystander is actually rooting for the attacker. None of this actually morally matters. It's only when, when you may harm B, it's because B has lost its, his immunity, not because he's lost his innocence, and because he is liable, not because he is, in fact, culpable. Okay. Um, how does moving the idea of self-defense into the idea of military conflict change things? Okay. Well, we might think that uh, war is a morality-free zone, or we might think that it's a rule-governed practice. Now, notice you, you can't hold both of these two things consistently. And Michael Walzer has eloquently uh, written more than, better than anyone else, why it is that we sh must not think of war as a morality-free zone. I mean, even if the actual attackers are ones who, contrary to what I said, are ones who have forfeited um, their claims under, under morality, it's certainly not the case that everyone around them has, right? So it is not a Hobbesian state of you know, war of all against all, uh, but rather it is in fact a rule-governed um, enterprise. Um, maybe it's the scale that matters. War, of course, is very large. It's not simply these one-on-one -on -one examples of 1A and 1D. Uh, it could be that war typically, or at least 
20th or 19th century war involves states, and maybe the fact that states are involved is what makes a difference. Let's start with rules. Um, of course, we've had the, the we've already been introduced to uh, use ad bellum and use uh, in bello, um, and also the reason why it is that we ordinarily uh, don't hold at least low-ranking soldiers um, accountable for the reasons for going to war. Um, ordinarily, it's unreasonable to hold them accountable. Um, because it's a rather difficult calculation, and you m mentioned quite rightly the incentives and the re reciprocity. Uh, so we want to modify, modify our account of what triggers self-defense. It's not that A wrongfully attacks D, but it's simply uh, when A attacks D. We don't make judgments of whether the attack is wrongful. You may, in fact, be on the wrong side of things in the, in the uh, US ad bellum situation, but still you're entitled to um, uh, self self-defense. Okay. Um, at least one side is always un at least one side is always unjustified in a war, uh, and rules can't make war symmetrically fair like a sporting match can. So the analogies to fair fights in, in sport really do run out. It's rather we act as if we act as if there are symmetrical rules because um, we don't hold enemy soldiers accountable for the, their leaders' purposes and because we want reciprocity for the treatment of our, our own soldiers. Okay, how does scale matter? Uh, well, war is an ongoing project. It's not a discrete action. Uh, Hobbes uh, very famously says, war is a condition like foul weather. He's talking about um, England, right? Um, so we have to do a modification. A, imminently attacking B, we, we have to drop that idea and introduce something else. A has undertaken the project of attacking D. Um, and if A has undertaken the project of attacking D, then effective defense of D uh, sometimes requires undertaking an offensive project against A, right? So, so we, we see how an in the military situation, things are scaling up. There's another important aspect of scale, which is war is a group project. I'm going to spend some time on this idea of war as a group project, not an individual action. So uh, we modify A attacks D into this. A is part of a group of A's attacking a group of D's, one of which is D. Okay. And again, an effective defense of group D requires undertaking an offensive project against group A. So there are limits to, to self-defense in the military context as well. If war is a group project, a more expansive specification of threat is justified. But as, of course, we've seen, still there is the discrimination between threats and non-threats is important. And some version of proportionality as well is important. Uh, let's go back to this idea of a group because we need to understand now what constitutes a group for these purposes and how being a member of a threatening group actually um, might change things. Now, I actually believe, um, somewhat controversially, that there are things called group agents. I don't mean anything spooky or metaphysical. It's not group minds or group brains or things like that. It's just that there are certain conditions under which a number of us together can be said to act together, and therefore we together um, can claim rights, not in virtue of this groupiness, because there's no metaphysical entity there, but in virtue of the individual rights that we have and we could be held to account. We can be responsible for our group action, even if any individual of us has not uh, pr particularly acted. Um, and I think that this is the case uh, because if we think about what a moral agent is, uh, I can offer conditions for what a moral agent is without actually referring to the wet thing between our ears, be referring to an actual psychology. A moral agent is an entity that can consider and can will and can act based on its considerations and its decisions to, to will. And since nothing there made reference to psychology or to brains, you could imagine groups of people functionally doing this thing called considering, willing, and doing. Okay? I think groups can sometimes pull that off. Corporations under law pull that off. Clubs and associations pull that off. And the largest example of a functioning group agent that we know about is the state and its citizens, where because of the kinds of procedures that it has and the ways in which people's, people are meshed together. You can say that a state is a group agent. Now, there are two kinds of groups, and this is uh, actually going to be important to our 21st century war um, situation. We can think of groups just in our ordinary parlance. Groups are people who have certain kinds of affinities, common sentiments, religion, language. They, they have feelings of solidarity. That's not the kind of group that I'm talking about that has significance. Okay. So yes, Judaism is a group in a certain sense, but no, Judaism does not have a way of um, 
collectively rendering decisions for action uh, that hold us all to account, at least not nowadays, right? A normative group is something uh, very particular, right? It's an entity that has the capacity to act as a shared agent, that itself is the proximate locus of moral responsibility and respect, and that is capable of wronging and being wronged, right? It can do that because it functions as an agent in the sense that it's able to consider, right, and to will and to act. Because of a complicated connection between it and its members, obligations and duties to the members can sometimes be discharged by discharging your obligation to the group. The actions of its members can sometimes make the group accountable, even though the group itself didn't, so, uh, and, and I think that when we understand by the analogy to corporations, we see how this, how this works, right? So an engineer um, manufactures, des designs a negligent car, and the shareholders pay the price. The shareholders aren't culpable, they've done nothing wrong, they haven't acted negligently, right? But we understand that for purposes of who pays the price, the shareholders pay the price because they're part members of this normative group. I will skip how it is that groups get become groups. Um, Oh, that was so interesting. Um, legitimate states are a kind of normative group. They're a kind of normative group that are put together, that are constituted by shared procedures like constitutions, right? And members, citizens, or subjects are conscripted to that group by uh, what Kant calls practical necessity, right? They, they really, um, rationality requires that they hang together in this way because it's the only way in which they can provide for um, their um, rational or necessary ends, to put it very briefly. Um, now, states have a more inclusive right in part because of, of the, the way in which it is a normative group. Uh, they have rights not only to bodily integrity and personal freedom, but also to territorial integrity and political freedom. But here's what gets a little tricky. They also have a more inclusive liability because there is a sense in which when you have a functioning normative group, of which I'm holding up a legitimate state as an example, there's a sense in which um, you can hold individuals of that group accountable in some measure, in some way, for the actions of the department, by analogy to holding shareholders of a corporation accountable in some way for the negligent actions of a corporation's engineers. Do you see where I'm going? Okay. 21st century warfare. How is it different? Well, it's different in at least three ways, and Yishai has mentioned, uh, has touched on all these. One is that there are unilateral violations of the rules of war um, by non-state group agents, right? Uh, and there's quite a bit of ambiguity about who the individuals are who are posing the threats. Okay, let's take this one by one. Uh, unilateral violations of rules of war. How are we supposed to think about that? Um, I think the way to do it is we re revert back to the basic self-defense case where A wrongfully attacks D, but um, we just simply have to go back to the moral case where we already concluded there's no unlimited right of self-preservation. The attacker does not forfeit all rights and self-defense is not punishment of the guilty. So, so what if someone is attacking me in violation of the rules of war. That simply puts us back to the original immoral case of someone who's trying to violate my basic rights. I can defend myself, right? But not in an unlimited way. The attacker doesn't forfeit all rights and um, the attacker is not to be punished by my counterattack, but punished in some other way. No, it's not fair. It's not fair. But that doesn't mean that morality doesn't require that of us. Attacks by non-state group agents. So attackers may constitute a normative group. You may have a group of terrorists, you may have a militia, you may have a, uh, an insurgency and a guerrilla group, uh, but the normative group that, is, that the attackers constitute not only does not but cannot act for the wider anthropological group. Note this well. This is one of the ways Perhaps unfair, Yishai. This is one of the ways in which civilians who are anthropologically, sociologically connected to the attackers get a bit of a moral free ride. Because unlike in states where, again, in some measure, citizens can be held to account for the actions of its government, 
with non-state actors, there's no there there. When there is not, the there there is not the anthropological group, which of course is there, but there is no normative group. Guerrilla groups are not properly constituted to personate or represent or speak for the people they say they are fighting on behalf of. And so we encounter individual non-threatening non civilians as we encounter in individuals in a state of nature. Our obligations are to them directly, not through any entity that speaks for them. Leaders of an illegitimate government may constitute a normative group, a group of thugs, a kleptocracy, who are, can be held accountable for each other's acts, but they do not, not only do not, they cannot act for the country's inhabitants. I don't even want to call them citizens because they may not in, even be citizens. Again, this is unfair, right? Because some of these citizens support the kleptocracy, right? Or some of the members of the anth anthropological group are cheering on the terrorists. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They are not threats. And if they are not threats, they are not liable to actions of self-defense. So there are serious limitations on individual liability that follow from this idea that these non-state actors are not, in my parlance, normative groups. Ambiguity of individual threats, absolutely there. They don't wear uniforms. It's unclear who's part. These, these, these threatening normative groups don't have membership lists. They may be getting material support in ways that we can't observe. Right? But still, I don't think this leads to any less protection of the civilian population, and in fact, it may lead to more for reasons that I've already explained. We confront civilians who may with some probability be also threats, but we don't know. We confront them like we confront individual people in a state of nature. We can't discharge our moral obligations towards them by treating their group in a certain way. We can't hold them accountable for the actions of a group that they are not, normatively speaking, a member of. Okay? Our moral relationship with individual civilians is unmediated by any legitimate government if we're in this 21st century situ situation where we're dealing with non-state actors or illegitimate governments. And so I conclude, not reluctantly but wistfully, because I certainly understand, Yishai, um, the, the horrible dilemmas and burdens and really sent deep sense of unfairness that you've described, uh, that not only does 21st century war not give us greater moral permission um, to engage in collateral damage, so to speak, of uh, civilian populations, but in some, at least in one respect, it actually tightens up these requirements. Thank you. So we'll take some questions from the floor for approximately 10 minutes. Yes. Fred? Uh, General Baer, thank you very much. Uh, I, I thought there was an amazing juxtaposition between your two thoughts. Uh, I'll, I'll try to brief my question. Could you talk about the issue that in the 21st century, unlike the 20th century, wars and groups in the are not between states, but the, the laws of war are designed for how the states are placed on the other. Indeed, we are talking about asymmetric wars. Asymmetric in a sense that uh, states are fighting non-state uh, groups. I think what we have to do when we look forward to the next century is to keep the f core values, what I think is ethical values, basic uh, intuition, that in a sense civilians should be spared. I mean, for the, for, let's take the case of Israel. And I've spoken about my own trauma vis-a-vis -vis the Lebanese front. I think Israel should do whatever it can in order not to kill, in order not to damage innocent civilians of its adversary. But if one is really wants to protect innocent civilians, there should be some other tools available to the defendant military, whether it's the American vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Al-Qaeda, or the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis Hamas or Hezbollah. And what are those tools? For example, targeted killing of whom? Of the leaders who conducted all those atrocities. Of course, talking about, for example, about targeted killing is extrajudicial assassination. 
which is quite common and fancy expression of what's going on. When you talk about Bin Laden, or when you talk about, in Israeli uh, reality, about the Hamas uh, uh, leaders of Hezbollah, they are instructing their own uh, uh, people to, to fire rockets. They are so-called commander-in-chief of their own terrorist, group, uh, ter uh, uh, terrorist groups. Say so they ought to pay the price. I mean, the international com com uh, community cannot enjoy, let's say, the Red Cross currently, in his uh, opinion, say, we are fully aware of the phenomenon known as the evolving door, namely, part-time terrorists. You are a farmer in the day, in the night you fire rockets, but then you wear your set of jeans or whatever, if it's a three-piece of suit, that's fine. You are a civilian. That's the current approach of the Red Cross. This is not acceptable. If you are a terrorist in the night, you are a terrorist, and as an army that wants to defend itself can uh, treat you as a target. If you want to spare civilians, you have to pay in some other coins. And I think leaders' responsibility is one of the uh, typical direction which we sh should go uh, uh, ahead uh, and, and, and uh, uh, legitimize, legitimize it. One of the things that seemed to have been missing from his analysis was the, um, the sort of moral safety of, of the individual soldier. I think it was you who mentioned that they're the ones who have the least in terms of a moral status, uh, the one who is attacked, uh, D. Uh, and all of uh, the comments about uh, the warfare being unfair in order to be moral tends to sort of leave the um, the defender um, in a very um, open and vulnerable spot. And I was going to sort of ask him, and I'll ask you, what about the sort of uh, the right of survival or, or the right to sort of uh, uh, to live for the defender, despite the unfair nature of the, um, of the, uh, of the attack and the situations that, uh, that Professor Applebaum uh, put forward? It seems that... Uh, one ends up becoming uh, a victim, a, a double victim, one by virtue of being attacked and two by the fact that you have to make a decision uh, to allow yourself to be killed even though you are wrongfully attacked by others. And, and he, he sort of seemed to have uh, left that part of the equation out. Of course, I can only uh, respond on my behalf, not on Professor Applebaum's. And I am not a philosopher, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, the mere fact that you are a soldier, you know, to be a soldier, it's quite a risky op occupation. It's not a Jewish profession. But, you know, in Israel, we are soldiers due to the fact that we don't have alternative. First, moral obligation to defend our state, and besides, you know, it's mandatory service in the Israeli army, even nowadays. So the mere fact that you are a soldier put you in risks. That's by definition. Professor Asa Kasher has agenda, and I'm sure that he will talk about it, that if you are uh, in the military, uh, like in Israel, where it's a mandatory service, it's put you to some extent in a different position than professional soldier. But this I leave to Asa, and I'm sure that he will talk about that. But remember the other side of the story. Indeed, the Israel soldiers who are defendant are currently under risks. But remember the other side, the innocent civilians of the adversary. And I do agree with Professor uh, Walter's argument in his book that in order to uh, be entitled to the uh, collateral uh, uh, damage so-called privilege, which allows you, at the end of the day, not to intend to kill the civilians, the innocent civilians of the adversary, but if you have done it unintentionally, you are still right, as long as the military gain achieved is substantial. But even then, you have to some extent to risk yourself in order, in order not to kill too many innocent civilians on the other side. And I brought two examples. In Kosovo, in 1999, uh, the US policy, the NATO policy, but I think it was President uh, Clinton's uh, order, zero casualties, no 
risk whatsoever to the American pilots. So they didn't issue early warnings and they, they bombed from high latitude. By comparison, I brought the example of the Israeli way of fighting in Gaza, in which Israel did risk its soldier to some extent. But I think that morally, the Israeli way is more justified because at the end of the day, unfortunately, you kill innocent babies on the other side. So it's a very delicate equation, but I think, and I do agree with Professor Walter's argument that in order to enjoy, enjoy the so-called collateral damage uh, a, a provision, you have to risk, at least to some extent, your own uh, soldiers. Thank you. Uh, this goes back to what you said about incentives uh, for transgression today. Uh, I understood most of your argument except for one of them. Uh, you mentioned how an incentive to transgress is that there's only a proportionality of response, so the aggressor wouldn't be punished too severely. Uh, there are no effective reparations, this is about the saying to the executive rule. Uh, and uh, you also said something about territories, and I just couldn't follow your logic. You mentioned that territories used to be kept by the aggressor today. No, the other way around. If you are defense, if you are in self-defense, in the old days, one of the punitive tools against an aggressor was to take territorial prizes. You annex his territories. But nowadays, under the prevailing rule, annexation of territories is not allowed anymore, even though you are on the defensive side. So when, uh, uh, for example, when the United States uh, uh, or the coalition forces uh, won the Iraqi war, they held many responsible vis-a-vis -vis the domestic population. The same treatment is being given to Israel. So you cannot, under f the formal prevailing rules, you are not allowed to have any territorial prizes, even though you are a defensive side. And even though you defend in a legitimate self-defense, Because you are not losing, you are not going to lose almost anything, and you are not losing your own land, even though that you are aggressor in transaction. Because at the end of the day, even though the defensive side took your territories, whether it's Lebanon or Gaza or the West Bank, at the end of the day, or Sinai Peninsula, you have to return it back under prevailing rules. So it's in, in, if the, in the, in the aggressor is not going to lose, he has an incentive to attack. He has only upper side and there is no downside to his aggression. That's the main argument of this segment of the argument. One last question, and then we're going to have to move on. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 Professor Walters, uh, I was curious about the answer is that I really don't know. First of all, when it comes to cyber, there is a threshold. In my age, you have to talk to my kids about all those uh, cyber affairs. <laughs> I know how to use <laughs> Word and Excel and that's it. <laughs> but I don't know. You're absolutely right that uh, a cyber war is some kind of a new warfare. And there should be some ethical standards regarding this war. But I have to admit I don't know. I'm a combat soldier, not an high-tech uh, professional. <laughs>